In this video, I'm going to tell you how two kinds of optical detectors take light as an input to capture an image for optical microscopy. An optical detector is a sensor device that converts an optical signal or light into an electrical signal. They're just about everywhere now. Not only are they used in imaging equipment such as optical microscopes, but they're also used in digital cameras and smartphones. Let's look at the general parts of a camera. First, light enters the camera when the shutter opens. The light is then directed by the camera lens through the lens aperture, an open shutter, and is finally captured at the image sensor. The image sensor, or array of optical detectors, is what captures the characteristics of the light that can be converted into digital information. There are two main types of these array or area image sensors used. Charge coupled devices, or CCDs, read the light at each pixel sequentially, or one at a time. That information is then transported through additional circuitry as an electrical signal and converted into digital information. Complementary metal oxide semiconductor, or CMOS, sensors read the light at each pixel simultaneously, rather than sequentially as in CCD sensors. The information captured at each pixel consists of the color and brightness of the optical signal. So how do these pixels work? How do they capture optical signals and turn them into electrical signals? To answer these questions, we realize that optical detectors are composed of semiconductors. Semiconductors differ between conductors and insulators in that they can become conductive or carry current under the right conditions. So what are these conditions? Well, let's look at the band theory of solids to understand conduction in semiconductors. Available energy states in solids form bands. In order to have conduction, there must be electrons in the conduction band where they can move freely through the material. The outermost electrons in the material's atoms are in the valence band. Now, a conductor's valence band overlaps the conduction band, so these electrons are free to move. But an insulator's valence band is greatly separated from its conduction band, meaning that the electrons are not free to move. However, in semiconductors, there is a small gap between the valence and conduction band. This means that if the electrons in the valence band are given the right amount of energy from thermal or other excitations, they can move into the conduction band. Furthermore, a Fermi level is characterized as the surface that electrons cannot cross at absolute zero temperature. At certain temperatures or excitations, electrons are able to have an energy above the Fermi level and enter the conduction band where they can create a small current. The number of electrons that can reach the conduction band will depend on the Fermi function and the number of available energy states. The Fermi level for silicon, a popular semiconductor, is at about halfway between the valence and conduction band. To increase the electrical properties of semiconductors, they're often doped with foreign atoms, which are placed into their crystal lattices. This doping shifts the Fermi level and leads to two types of semiconductors. N-type semiconductors are those which accept the donations of extra electrons from the foreign atoms, thus the charge carriers are the negatively charged electrons. This shifts the effective Fermi level to about halfway between the donor levels in the conduction band. For example, look at five silicon atoms, each with four valence electrons. Let's take out the central silicon atom away and replace it with an antimony atom, which has five electrons in the valence band. When this foreign atom is added to the crystal lattice of silicon, there is one extra electron, which is free to move around. P-type semiconductors are those which donate their electrons to foreign atoms, leaving vacancies or holes in the lattice. These holes act like positively charged particles that can move through the material. This shifts the Fermi level to about halfway between the acceptor level and the valence band. Let's go back to the silicon example. If we replace the central atom with a boron atom, which has three valence electrons, then we see that we lost one electron, creating a hole. When there is an applied voltage, the electrons with energy above the Fermi level and now in the conduction band can contribute to an electric current. In an intrinsic semiconductor such as pure silicon, we can see the flow of electrons and holes when a potential is applied. Now, what happens when we put a PNN type semiconductor together? By putting the two types of semiconductors together, a junction is created that allows current to only flow in one direction or forward bias. This is a basic diode. It occurs because some of the free electrons in the n-type region diffuse across the junction, or the depletion region, to combine with holes to form negative ions, which leaves behind positive ions. When these ions form at equilibrium, they prevent further electrons from diffusing across. When a forward bias is set due to an applied voltage, making the p-type more positive, it assists electrons in overcoming the Coulomb barrier of the charge within the depletion region, and they move leftward, filling hole to hole as they go. But what does all this have to do with optical detectors? Like I said before, optical detectors are connected to an external circuit so that the optical signals can be converted into electrical signals. When a diode is sensitive to light, free electrons can be produced from the onset of light that has the right quantum or a discrete amount of energy. These are known as photodiodes, and there is one behind every pixel in the image sensor I mentioned before. Photodiodes work due to the photovoltaic effect. This effect is described as the onset of light creating a voltage at the PN junction due to the amount of light energy that is absorbed. Then, free electron hole pairs are created 
and these then lead to a current when the photodiode is short-circuited, meaning that the current will flow as long as the photodiode is illuminated. The current that can be drawn through an external load resistor increases with increasing light level. The photodiode light detector is a current-to-voltage converter, meaning that the voltage output of this circuit is proportional to the current in the photodiode, if the photodiode's response to light is linear. A silicon photodiode's responsivity is best between wavelengths of 190 to 1100 nanometers, making them suitable for commonly used laser wavelengths such as argon, helium neon, aluminum gallium arsenide, and others. One variation of a photodiode is an avalanche photodiode. These have the ability of internal gain. Avalanche photodiodes have a diffusive PN junction with surface contouring that allows high reverse bias without breakdown. An internal electric field leads to multiplication of the number of charge carriers through ionizing collisions, which increases the signal. These have been used in some confocal microscopes and wide-field fluorescence microscopes. In contrast, photomultiplier tubes are optical detectors that work differently from photodiodes. Whereas photodiodes work due to the photovoltaic effect, photomultipliers work due to the photoemissive effect. When light is incident on a photoemissive detector's cathode, fitted with mixtures containing alkali metals, electrons are given enough energy to be ejected or emitted from it. They then accelerate to an anode due to an applied voltage and create a current in the external circuit. These detectors are enclosed in vacuum to allow the free flow of electrons after they have been emitted. Photomultipliers can amplify the current because of secondary emitting sources known as dynodes. These are arranged such that electrons from each dynode go to the next dynode in series. So as one electron is emitted from the cathode and accelerated by an applied voltage, its impact on the first dynode causes the emission of many secondary electrons, and their impact on the next dynode multiplies the number of emitted electrons even more, leading to an increase in current. The high gain process gives photomultipliers the best responsivity when looking at ultraviolet, visible, and near-infrared parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, but not past wavelengths of 1000 nanometers. These are commonly used in confocal microscopes and spectrometers. After the light has been converted into electrical signals, external circuitry is able to convert those into digital information that can be readily displayed onto a liquid crystal display. These optical detectors make it possible to image samples in living cells without disturbing their natural environment in optical microscopy. For example, when collecting light from mercury arc lamps in fluorescence microscopy. This concludes the video and I hope you learned something and enjoyed it.